So, Dr. Fayed, one of the fun facts I learned when first meeting you is that you were the first person to hold the title of Chief Data Officer. I think it'd be great if you can share that story with everyone. Yeah, this was back in uh, 2003, 2004. Um, I was uh, uh, running a, a startup and uh, one of our clients, Yahoo, kind of was engaging with us to figure out you know, what to do with data and, and how to fix it. And they reached the conclusions that the, the payoffs were so high that they reached the conclusion that, hey, we're going to acquire the whole, the whole company here and, and seed the, the, the data team with it. Uh, Yahoo is a great example of a company that was sitting on a gold mine of, of data. Um, and it had a lot of value that wasn't uh, being realized uh, because they, they, you know, they didn't know how to link events happening on different parts of the Yahoo network together so that to say like, oh, Jeff, Jeff was on the Yahoo Autos part of the site where he's looking at potentially buying a car but, uh, and we sell ads to him at a high premium, but hey, he now shows up on email and there the advertiser will not pay high premium. So how do we convince the advertiser that, hey, that's the same Jeff and we know that they're still interested in a car and therefore the, that same ad can be sell, sold for 10 times the value. Anyway, the discussion was with the, uh, this is the almost final discussion when we agreed on all the terms of the acquisition and then, you know, uh, Jerry Yang turns around and says, well, what should we call you? And, you know, you're going to be part of the exec team. And Yahoo has this uh, culture of irreverent titles. So, uh, you know, they all had funny titles. And I said, I, I actually don't really care. I'm here only for two years. I ended up spending more than that. But um, so, you know, one of them turns around and says, well, well, we'll call you chief data officer. That sounds funny enough. And then there was laughter in the room. And uh, that, that was how the, the title was created initially as a joke. Uh, and then fast forward a few years later, uh, seven, eight years later, and I'm uh, somewhere in London giving a keynote talk. I'm now the uh, global chief data officer at Barclays. And somebody walks up to me and says, hey, uh, Usama, did you know that there are over a thousand chief data officers in the industry? And I kind of nodded saying, no, I didn't realize it was that big. I'm sure it's much bigger now. Um, and I didn't share back that, hey, it all started as a joke. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. In fact, I have a few friends in the, in the tech industry that are chief data officers. So I've shared that story with them. And I look at them a bit differently now, knowing that the, uh, the initial title was a joke, but it's worked out quite well. So you clearly have an excessive background in software, data science, machine learning, uh, and one of the, the world's leading authorities on experiential AI, which I learned about uh, meeting you as well. How familiar with, uh, were you with additive manufacturing before you were introduced to post-process? Um, actually, I, I thought I understood the industry. I thought I understood that, you know, what, what the printers were. I was uh, on, on boards, advisory boards of companies that use the technology. I was, uh, we even in one of my startups, we had one and it was always a, a 3D printer. And it was always fascinating to kind of look at it in action. Uh, but uh, I never thought, I always thought it was like, okay, the printer is done. Somebody comes, takes the part out, and that's it. Either plugs it in somewhere or utilizes it as a prototype. And didn't realize until I actually spoke uh, to you and others at Post Process that, hey, that's only the beginning of the story. There is so much work to be done after the part is printed. You know, who gets rid of the, of the supports? Uh, who polishes the, the surfaces? Who gets rid of the you know, uh, excessive material, all of that. And uh, I had never thought about that. And I think a lot of folks who uh, utilize 3D printing don't think about that, but it turned out to be fairly ubiquitous. Everybody has this problem. It's kind of hidden from sight, but uh, a big deal. And, and many times you discover that, you know, the, the design didn't work until you kind of printed it out and you're trying to post-process it to get it out uh, in the right shape, etc. So that, you know, that to me was kind of the big uh, news flash uh, when, I, when I was uh, talking to the folks at Post Process. Right. Yeah, when I first met Daniel, our founder, back in uh, late 2015, I thought, why would you need to do anything once it comes off the printer? And, and boy, is there quite a bit of work to do. Any other surprises uh, about the industry as you've gotten deeper and deeper into additive over the past few months? Well, the fact, uh, I mean, to me, it's, it's both a surprise and an inspiration in a way is, you know, in, in, in speaking to Daniel, he always talks about this digital thread, which I never thought about, which is, 
you know, all the way from conception and design through kind of the printing, through the post-processing and through the deployment, you kind of discover mistakes, you discover issues, you discover, hey, this is not strong enough in this part and didn't work, even though all the other steps worked very nicely. Um, and to me, that whole vision of saying, what if we are able to capture that data and capture what's going on and learn from that loop, that experience of, you know, this kind of part in this kind of setting with these kinds of requirements uh, is going to run into these kinds of issues. And you need to think about these, these things before, you know, post-process issues before you even print or at design time, et cetera. So connecting that digital thread was a, a big uh, kind of uh, uh, discovery for me because I never thought about it that way. I always thought of these things as silos and they had very little to do with each other, which is how they function today in the industry, unfortunately. Uh, let me turn that one around to you, Jeff. Like, what, what was the big discovery for you in this field? Yeah, yeah great question. Uh, so uh, three things. Uh, uh, first is the digitization opportunity. Uh, second is the differentiation. And third is the market growth. And so just to touch on each one of those briefly, from a digitization perspective, I've spent the last 20 years working for companies that have taken analog processes and then made them digital. And so I did that in mapping uh, with the road network at Navtech. And then after Navtech, I went to Climate Corp, uh, a Silicon Valley startup, where we were digitizing the farm. And so uh, when I met Daniel, it took me a few conversations to fully understand his vision. But basically, he was talking about digitizing the tribal knowledge of the technicians, and in many cases, engineers that are working uh, to remove the supports or finish the surface of a 3D printed part. So I thought, wow, uh, manufacturing, huge market, $13 trillion market, we could utilize some of the same principles of taking analog functions and making them digital in this massive market. Secondly, uh, when we talk about the post printing, uh, it's the third step in the overall additive operation. So we think about it in terms of design, print and post print. And the vast majority of investment has been made in the printing step as well as the design step. And so again, uh, Daniel with his unique visionary abilities identified that there was going to be a growing need to automate that third step in the process. And so through our full stack solution of software, chemistry, and hardware, I felt that we had good differentiation. We can't rest. Uh, we're up to 64 uh, patents in total, uh, many applied for, some granted. Uh, but I really felt that that segment of the market had been neglected, and we had a chance to be the pioneers to automate that third step of the process as well as connect it. And overall, the market's growing very quickly. Uh, as horrific as the pandemic has been, uh, for the world, it's actually been a catalyst to get additive manufacturing in view of C-level executives uh, for production opportunities, which is very exciting for us. And we just see uh, significant investments continuing in all different market segments from automotive to aerospace to medical to consumer goods, you name a manufacturing segment, and uh, they're using additive in some way, shape or form. And we see that continuing to grow. And so, again, my last two companies, it was early on, we were the pioneers in each one of those markets. Uh, to bring uh, an analog function into the digital world. I think we have a, a tremendous opportunity uh, here at Post Process to do the same thing uh, for manufacturing and really redefine how manufacturing is done going forward. And, and, and ca capturing that data and figuring out how to model it and use it is key, by the way. A lot of people don't think uh, about uh, bringing in AI, which requires... Uh, you know, the, 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 the secret in, 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 in the AI world is that, you know, the only AI that works is the AI that uh, has two, two properties. One, it's very data driven because most of the time the algorithms aren't good enough. And therefore the data is, is driving the machine learning and the regression to allow us to kind of guess what the outcome should be. And, and the second is someone has to figure out, you know, how does a human fit into that loop? How do you make that AI human centered? Because it is about amplifying the abilities of humans, not about re replacing the, their abilities. Uh, so that's really key to hear you talk about kind of capturing that data and knowledge from, from practicing and from printing, and then figuring out how to utilize that and leverage it, both for, for design and for post-processing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and your background in experiential AI, which includes that human element, is, is a perfect fit. And, uh, and, and in the few months that you've been associated with us becoming part of our board, uh, the guidance you've already provided has been impactful uh, as we do leverage uh, the, uh, the data that we're capturing, which is growing 
uh, leaps and bounds uh, week in and week out. Um, and so once you discovered this post-printing bottleneck, uh, what is it uh, that drew you to want to work with us? Besides, of course, uh, the charming personality that Daniel and I both possess. <laughs> well, <laughs> so thank you for the kind words and, and for the compliments to yourselves. <laughs> I think they're well deserved. But uh, no, more seriously, uh, I love I love you know solving puzzles. I love problems where you've got the pieces, and you're trying to figure out how do you fit them together. So connecting that digital thread, where data is is essential in it, figuring out how to leverage it. Uh, in different parts of the of the manufacturing process uh, is also interesting. It's also, honestly, it's the future when I think about it, uh, both from a sustainability perspective as well as from how we approach and think of, you know, how we manufacture stuff, right? Customization, personalization uh, in everything is becoming the norm now. Uh, and, you know, honestly, additive manufacturing is is a way to address that kind of, personalized world in, in manufacturing, be it kind of on, on medical parts, be it on personalizing for a particular device, be it on you know print on demand when, when something breaks down versus creating a huge inventory and, 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 and holding that inventory and perhaps using it or never using it. Um, you know that the, in principle, the industry just being additive is, is a whole different philosophy for how, how to build stuff. And to me, that looks like the way of the future. And I like to be part of both solving important puzzles and being part of that way of the future. Got it. You know, one of the other intriguing things, Usama, uh, when we first uh, started talking was clearly from a technical perspective, uh, you bring a lot of insight. You used big data in a variety of markets, but you also have extensive business experience in the startup scale-up world. I, I think folks would be interested to hear how your work has played a pretty significant role in ushering AI and big data into the digital age, both from a technical perspective, as well as a business and business model perspective. Yeah, and I've, I've, been, I've been privileged, honestly, to have been part of some, some great companies and, and, and exposed to, to some great uh, problems at the right timing, right? So I started, my career started over at uh, NASA JPL, where I was basically helping uh, scientists, and at the time, scientists, uh, ironically, scientists had much more data than, than companies. It's amazing how that picture flipped afterwards. But uh, so, so, so astronomers were trying to find objects that are very far in the universe and very faint. Uh, uh, people were trying to recognize small volcanoes on Venus after sending, you know, a multi-billion dollar mission like the Magellan uh, spacecraft to kind of uh, orbit the planet and take pictures of it. Uh, we had tons of data coming in from the Earth observing system. And we did stuff in atmospherics and kind of tracking and all of that. Uh, the transition then through Microsoft was to think about, well, how does this technology apply to the rest of humanity, right? Beyond science. Uh, what, what does it mean for a company? What does it mean for a database platform? How do you bring the algorithms to the data and make it easy to apply machine learning and, and data science and data mining uh, to these problems? And there we, we kind of uh, had the chance to, to place a good role in, in figuring out how to crack some of these platform uh, issues. Uh, then I did a couple of startups. One was uh, uh, in, in kind of hosting uh, databases and data warehouses and, and, and applying kind of machine learning on them in the hosted model, uh, which was kind of ahead of its time. And, and that's a, a spinoff of that company got acquired by Yahoo there. Got the chance to kind of see how much impact you know, just like it was revolutionary in science, suddenly I understood like you could translate this to billions of dollars in value for companies like Yahoo and, and others. And from there, it was Open Insights where we worked with uh, a lot of companies in different uh, uh, verticals, manufacturing, um, uh, banking, private equity, um, um, telcos, et cetera on trying to figure out, you know, how do we help them? How do you democratize this ability to leverage data and to leverage AI to make it work? And uh, by the way, I mean, another, another thing that's not known to most uh, people, I said before that AI is highly dependent on data. Well, guess what? Uh, Gartner says 90% of data in any company, whether you're a tech company or not, is, a, is, is unstructured data. So it's not in, you know, relational databases. 
That's 90% of the data. And uh, think about it, almost 100% of the databases speak structured only, which means we are living in an age where we're ignoring 90% of the potential assets we have. So there's a huge uh, kind of frontier around how do you leverage this data that's unstructured, be it images, be it text, be it contracts, be it uh, uh, you know, EHRs, electronic health records, all of these things. Uh, how do you leverage all of that and, and kind of make it available to be used to drive intelligence, to drive uh, an amplification of the human abilities? Got it. Yep. You know, one of the other things that's very important to us at Post Process is sustainability, and I know important to you as well. Can you speak to the trends you're seeing uh, with regards to sustainability in the world of high tech? Yeah, I think we're 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 fast we're fast maturing in the world of high tech to become much more sensitized to issues of sustainability. You know, people create big data centers and never think that the biggest cost of data center is not the physical facility; it's actually the energy that's being consumed in these data centers. And and now the game the game becomes how do you create these data centers at places where you could get kind of low impact on environment. Uh, similarly, uh, if you think about uh, you know, the way of the future in, in additive manufacturing, as an example, and, and just to keep it relevant. Um, well, what are the issues there? How do, you, how do you go after kind of printing stuff with minimal energy, minimal materials? How do you optimize the utilization of those materials when you're doing uh, things like post-processing, uh, uh, just to be super relevant to, to our topic? Um, well, how do you avoid, you know, humans getting exposed to you know, harmful materials and harmful actions and safety issues with when you're physically trying to do something or getting exposed to vapors and chemicals of corrosives and all of that. This is why I loved the approach uh, post-process is taking with its appliance approach that says, you know, let, let the machine do it. And by the way, we'll show you how the machine can manage the materials and the consumables much better, et cetera. All of those you know, interesting optimization problems are critical towards defining this in a sustainable way that has less harmful impact on humans, less harmful impact on our environment. And I actually think additive manufacturing will play a huge role in kind of enabling the, the innovations that are needed to create machines, transportation devices, all of that, that, that will minimize the impact on the environment. You, you, know, you need that kind of advanced way of being able to produce you know, these, these more complicated parts. Yeah, all great points. All great points and part of our core mission uh, at Post Process. So one last question. Uh, beyond overcoming the bottleneck uh, that we've discussed, what are you most looking forward to uh, in regards to seeing a fully connected end-to-end -end digitized process uh, for additive manufacturing? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of work to get to that full end-to-end -end, and you got to solve it in, in pieces. And what I look forward to is kind of, you know, how, how do we... How do we put those pieces together and how do we kind of serve as a, a helpful agent to kind of integrate this, this fragmented industry? And, and by connecting that digital thread, how do, we, how do we make the story better, more efficient, less experimental, more production oriented, and, and much more sustainable, frankly? Uh, so all, all, and I look forward to, to working with the team on solving many of the puzzles along connecting that digital thread. Excellent. Well, and I know from your days at Michigan, running through Canada to get to Buffalo to, to pick up some buffalo wings <laughs> for the weekend, uh, we're excited to have you out to Buffalo, hopefully for our July board meeting, and, uh, and have you relive some of those college days, enjoying a number of different flavors of buffalo wings, which uh, is one of the things that also attracted me to Post Process, being headquartered in Buffalo. Looking forward to it, Jeff. Excellent. Any other questions for me, Usama, before we wrap up? No, that's, uh, I mean, uh, thanks for the opportunity. And I, I actually think it's a very, very exciting uh, frontier you guys are driving uh, and uh, just honored to be part of it.